this event was put together by the Justina M. Barnacki Gallery at Hart House, University of Toronto, by organizers from Idol No More Toronto, Muskrat Magazine, the Indigenous Sovereignty and Solidarity Network, and with sponsorship from the Indigenous Education Network. But it was also made possible through some of our generous donors, QP3902, the Graduate Geography and Planning Student Society at U of T, of which I'm a proud member, and the CAW Sam Ginton Chair in Social Justice at Ryerson University. But I'd also just really like to take a moment to thank all of the individuals who donated online, even you know from a few dollars to a couple of hundred dollars. Um, I want to thank you especially for your generosity, for making uh, it possible for us to serve lunch to people, to provide activities for children, and all of those things really were dependent on the kindness of individuals. So I'd like to really acknowledge all those people who, who gave whatever they could. I'd like to mention the groups who are endorsing this event, the Christian Peacemaker Teams, Educators for Peace and Justice, the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD University, the Social Justice and Community Engagement Committee at Bathurst United Church, Grand River Indigenous Solidarity, QP Ontario, the Sam Gindian Chair at Social Justice, Earth Roots, Oakbrook Toronto, the Women's Human Rights Education Institute, the Center for Women's Studies and Education at OISE, the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto, the Toronto Women for a Just and Healthy Planet, and the Raging, Raging Asian Women Taiko Drummers. So thank you very much to everyone who endorsed. My name is Shiri Pasternak. Um, I work with the Indigenous Sovereignty and Solidarity Network in Toronto, and also um, I'm a member of the Barrier Lake Solidarity Collective and an ally in the Defenders of the Land Network. So I want to thank, um, acknowledge all the women that I've been working with for the last two months uh, to put this together. Rebecca, Rebecca Tababadong, Tannis Nielsen, Wanda Nanabush, and Audrey Huntley. They have been working so hard. Please give them a round of applause for all of you. So it's really a deep pleasure to introduce um, the Defenders of the Land panels, um, especially the conversation between two esteemed Indigenous thinkers, Russell Dybo and Arthur Manuel. Um, two people who don't agree about everything, Russell reminded me, but <laughs> who nonetheless um, share an unwavering commitment to their people and who have a depth and um, a depth of experience and knowledge to share with us that I feel like is unparalleled almost in this country today. So it's a real honor to introduce them to you. Um, before I do that, I just want to say a few words about Randy Kapishesit, who we're dedicating these series of panels to. Uh, Randy was a big part of Indigenous Sovereignty Week. Um, that's how I met him. And uh, we just kind of heard him speak at the back of the room, making comments about the different panels we were organizing. And we just knew immediately we had to get him on a panel for the following year. There was one thing that Randy talked about um, was a vision of indigenous economies. And that was a vision for how indigenous people could build up um, their communities from the traditions and customs of their lands and to manage their land according to their own cultural and spiritual understandings of place. I feel like we've honored some of that vision today with Leanne Simpson talking about um, ecologies of intimacy and Aaron Dietler talking about jurisdiction, how this is really um, not, indigenous rights aren't a, a matter of um, consultation, they're a matter of jurisdiction, and jurisdiction really raises the question of whose laws should apply on these lands. And we're going to continue that conversation right now and fulfill um, our commitment to Randy to uphold this vision and to pursue his goals with this conversation between uh, Russell Dybo and Arthur Manuel. So in that spirit, I'd like to introduce um, these two members of the Defenders of the Land Steering Committee which is a national grassroots network of indigenous activists um, that I'm gonna ask the speakers to speak to as well. Um, uh, the Defenders of the Land was formed in November 2008 at a historic meeting in Winnipeg where defenders from coast to coast, from Inuit defenders on one coast to indigenous women from the downtown east side on the other came together to strategize about how to work together to um, 
fight for indigenous rights, and it was the kind of meeting, as our ally Peter Kulczynski put it, that made the government really, really nervous to have all those people in the same room together. Um, Defenders has recently partnered with um, Idol No More, and we're going to hear more about that in the second panel with one of the founders of Idol No More, Sheila McLean, who's with us today. Russell Daibo is a Mohawk from the Ganawage Reserve. He's the publisher and editor of the First Nation Strategic Bulletin. He's, as I mentioned, um, on the steering committee for Defenders of the Land, and he works with the uh, Wolf Lake First Nation in Kippewa today. Art Manuel is a member of the Nuskalnith Indian Band at the, of the Sequetmec Nation in Kamloops, British Columbia. He's the spokesperson for the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade, um, a network of Indigenous organizations who are achieving recognition for Aboriginal title and treaty rights at the international level. He served as elected chief for the Nuskalnith Indian Band, also as chairperson for the Shushwap Nation Tribal Council for six years, and the Interior Alliance for four years during that period. He's really familiar with Indigenous politics from the ground level of being a chief on a reserve all the way to the international level where he took Indigenous rights and Aboriginal title rights all the way up to the World Trade Organization and works actively with the United Nations as well on indigenous issues, the permanent forum. So I'm gonna start off by talking, putting a question to Russ. Um, Russell Daibo has become, um, perhaps grudgingly, one of the spokespeople for the Idle No More movement. He's been um, uh, asked to participate in dozens of media interviews and is featured in what's become a viral video recounting the history of settler colonialism in Canada. And so he's really coined this term of termination policy. And so we're going to uh, talk today about termination policy, but also about um, strategies for moving forward from termination towards self-determination. So I'm going to start by asking Russ to talk about um, the vision behind defenders of the land in terms of moving forward with indigenous rights and um, to also talk about the language of termination and where that comes from. <clears throat> Thank you, Sherry. Good afternoon. Um, I guess uh, in terms of defenders of the land, um, as uh, Sherry pointed out, that was a network of indigenous communities and non-indigenous supporters that was formed in 2008. Yeah, I'm getting old like Art, so I can't remember as well. <laughs> So um, it started from us, uh, Art and I, talking about the need for all these local struggles to get together because we're all facing the same problem coming from Ottawa at the federal level and from the provincial capitals across uh, the country and the territorial capitals in north of 60. And the fact that, uh, you know, different struggles had to get together and form a, a national network to start um, taking on uh, the forces that were at work um, you know, attacking uh, indigenous rights and, um, you know, encroaching on the territories and resources, you know, continuing to, basically continuing to steal lands and resources from indigenous peoples, uh, which is in effect a subsidy for the Canadian economy, which Art can speak to. Um, but in analyzing um, the situation, um, you know, I do a newsletter, as Shiri pointed out, and one of the things I started to write about, because I've been doing that for over 10 years now, and I've been talking about, you know, the dangers of what the Cretchen government was doing and what the Paul Martin government was doing and now what the Harper government's doing. But it's only recently, since um, I Don't Know More woke a lot of people up, that people started paying attention to, uh oh, there is a threat. And, it, you know, a lot of people have been talking about Bill C-45 and C-38, the omnibus bills and, you know, the changes to other laws that has and the impacts on the environment and, and rights. But I kept saying it, it goes beyond the legislation, it goes to the policy framework the government's using. Termination policies, I call them. Uh, the comprehensive, well, the land claims policies of the federal government and the self-government policy of the federal government. Um, because um, <clears throat> my, my thesis is that we have the old constitution, section 9124, that's how they passed the Indian Act, that's really how they've colonized the country, is under that part of the constitution. When the new constitution was adopted, uh, section 35 was supposed to hold the promise for us to build a new relationship and basically decolonize. 
there were a series of constitutional talks in the 80s to do that. Those ended in failure. And the key issue that was, you know, at those talks was, is self-government an inherent right or is it a delegated right? And um, the governments kept saying, well, you know, Section 35 is empty until you reach an agreement with us to fill it up. And the national uh, Aboriginal organizations representatives kept saying, no, it's a full box. It's full and has all of our rights and you just need to recognize them. Anyway, that debate went around and around the table. The governments kept putting on the table a proposal to get into negotiations to reach agreements, at which point self-government would happen. Those talks ended in failure in 1987 when Meech Lake, they started negotiating the Meech Lake Accord secretly with Quebec. <clears throat> and the reason I uh, picked up on the termination uh, term, because I've, I've uh, my academic experience is on both sides of the border. I lived on the Navajo Reservation in the 70s and you know, I went to school at Berkeley in Native American Studies, and I studied with Vine Deloria Jr., uh, uh, an American Indian lawyer, a Sioux lawyer, uh, in Tucson in 1983-84. So I, I've kind of been able to compare and contrast the policies. Well, the reason I started using the word termination is because it's an American uh, policy term to terminate the status of American Indian tribes or Native American tribes. One of the first ones they used it on was the Menominees in Wisconsin. Uh, they lost their uh, status as a tribe in the 1950s. And they were prosperous, you know, they were, uh, you know, had um, forestry and, you know, doing other businesses there. As soon as they lost their uh, status, one of the main people from their community, uh, Ada Deer, was one of the main ones lobbying the uh, federal government to get their status back, recognized as a tribe. And actually, it was Richard Nixon in the 1970s that uh, restored the, their status as a tribe. But the reason why I picked up on the term to apply to, there's 93 negotiating tables across Canada right now that are negotiating under the comprehensive claims or self-government policies. In some tables, they're negotiating both policies at the same time. In some cases, it's just self-government talks. But there's 93 tables. I haven't counted them all up, but I'm estimating probably about 300 bands. So half the bands in the country are at one of these tables. And I call them termination tables because the whole purpose of those negotiations is to come up with agreements that will define Section 35 rights. But my view is they're emptying out Section 35 of any real legal or political meaning by getting these groups to sign on to basically becoming municipalities within Canada. Some have done it already. Uh, my view is the Nishka have done it. Uh, Toasin have done it. Uh, Manoth, these modern treaties in BC, they've, they've basically become municipal type governments. And there are other groups negotiating that right now. And um, the reason why I used the American term termination was because of Tom Flanagan. He's, he's no longer with us, but when I wrote about it, he was around. And he was an American, and he was uh, importing American Indian policy ideas into Canada, you know, with his book, First Nations, Second Thoughts. Uh, his idea of promoting this uh, individual ownership idea, this private ownership initiative, along with uh, Manny Jules of Sequebuk. And, um, you know, they, uh, that's very similar to the Dawes Allotment Act. They say it's different. They're saying there's differences, but in effect, you know, the effect is they want to undermine collective rights and focus on individual rights. And uh, that's uh, what I'm referring to termination. It means terminating the pre-existing rights and exchanging them for new rights under these new agreements. But that's why I picked up on the term termination. It comes from the American side, and I think it's, it is reflective of what's happening in Canada right now. Thanks, Russ. Um, Art also talks about extinguishment and the the framework for his analysis of extinguishment to take a step back as a broader analysis of the whole basis for Canadian assertions of sovereignty to even be able to um, draft this legislation and pass this policy so I wonder if Art you could speak to um, the doctrines of discovery and the work that you do about the legal context for Canadian termination in conversation with what Russ just described. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that's uh, very critical when we're talking about uh, 
colonization here in, in, in Canada and in the United States is uh, the colonial doctrines of, of discovery, which both Canada and the United States are using uh, in order to justify, you know, that the uh, federal and provincial or state or, or federal or state Germans control uh, our land and, and our resources. The colonial doctrines of discovery is sort of a very racist concept, a property concept um, that says that Europeans, simply because they're Europeans can and because they call themselves explorers, can basically claim our land right from under our feet. And uh, that has been a legal concept that has been used by the Department of Justice here in Canada and by the Attorney General. It was actually used in the Chalcotin case just recently by the BC Court of Appeal, being appealed at the Supreme Court of Canada. So it's not like an ancient law, you know. It's what says in Canada that all our Aboriginal tree territories accrue to the Crown. And that's wrong, you know. That kind of um, racist property concept needs to be outlawed just like slave law was outlawed where at one time it used to be legal that white people could own black people as slaves you know that's the colonial doctrines of discovery are equal to that kind of uh, hardship for indigenous people you know because indigenous people have systemically or systematically been impoverished by that. Like for instance, in British Columbia, for example, British Columbia is larger than uh, California, Oregon, and Washington states combined. You know how much Indian Reserve land is in BC? 0.36%. That means the white people or provincial government controls 99.64%. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who's going to be rich and who's going to be poor. You know, it's the person that gets point, you know, uh, you know, 36% that's going to be impoverished of a dollar, you know. And then native people then self-abuse themselves why are we poor? Why are we not wealthy? Why are we, uh, you know, why are we uh, at the bottom of the economic totem pole all the time? And it has nothing to do with them as people. It has to do with the way uh, the federal government has imposed itself on our land over here. You know, non-native people have to ask themselves, well, if Christopher Columbus and Samuel D. Champlain and Jacopo and, and uh, Captain Cook and all these guys aren't the grounds for our reason for being here, what is? And the only reason you have to be here is your human rights. You know, and Native people have always recognized your human rights. You know, that's been one of the things that have been part of the, the two-world two wampum and other things when you listen to the elders talk about that. But you need to also recognize our human rights as indigenous people. And one of them is that under here is the Aboriginal treaty rights of the indigenous people, you know, from this territory, you know. it's. You know, why should the settler be the only one that benefits from those Aboriginal tree rights? You know, there has to be a whole rethinking and reshaping of an economy in this country based upon some equality between indigenous people and settlers, you know, but the first step you need to do is get rid of the UN Declaration, I mean, get rid of the uh, colonial doctrines of discovery and replace it with the UN Declaration 
on the rights of indigenous people. You know, those are the two counterbalancing forces that there exists right now. You know, even the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples report, its first major recommendation to Canada is to get rid of the colonial doctrines of discovery. And the United Nations, like I was <clears throat> the Global Caucus Chair for the UN um, Permanent Forum last year, the first talk we gave was on the colonial doctrines of discovery, you know, asking, you know, the UN to condemn it as basically a crime against humanity. But those are things that are the beginning points where I think indigenous people have to focus because you need to get rid of that. You know, because I know in BC, for instance, they say that Aboriginal title is unclear and undefined. I think that's totally a lie because we base our title on the fact that our family and relatives are buried in our territory for over the last 10,000 years. What do they have to claim their right to be here? The fact that Alexander Mackenzie, you know, David Thompson, Simon Fraser, or Captain Cook, or Captain Vancouver, you know, went there, these five white guys, and they claimed all the land. It's their title that's unclear and undefined. Thank you. <laughs>
um, even with uh, communities who aren't who have been resisting that policy, they're putting a pressure under them now to come to the table under negotiations. Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically blackmail. But like I said, you've got over 300 bands probably at these 93 tables. And you know, you can look up the tables yourself. They're they're listed on the Aboriginal Affairs website. You know, if you go to that September 4th uh, press release of uh, 2012, this results based approach. There's a chart there. And it has it, you know, province by province, which tables and what they're negotiating, where they're at. So I'm not making this stuff up. The tables are there. The only thing I did is call them termination tables. Because mm -hmm. in the end, that's what the government's trying to do, is terminate these pre-existing rights. Like I said, in exchange for these newly defined rights, which they're limiting and uh, restricting. So the doctrine of discovery, the way it's being played out now, is they know the courts, like in the Delgamuk decision, said Aboriginal title exists in Canada. That came down in 1997. But even the groups who were in court, they put the matter back to trial and laid out a legal test for that. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't afford to go back to court again, so they encouraged other groups that could to do it. But again, those are millions of dollars to prove the Delgamuk test. Uh, meanwhile, they didn't change their comprehensive claims policy to accommodate you know, the principles that the courts laid out. So you know, they were taking advantage of the poverty, um, forcing people into the only game in town, which is these tables. Once you're at the tables, they're telling you, okay, here's what's on the table, what's not on the table. And, you know, the groups that are signing on, like I say, are basically transforming themselves from being Indian bands in Canada to becoming munis ethnic municipalities, federally created. And uh, that's, that's where everybody's headed, uh, unless they can get these policies uh, turned around, because the Constitution says Aboriginal treaty rights are recognized and affirmed but the policies say it's denied and extinguished. So there's a big contradiction between what they're negotiating and what the Constitution says is supposed to be there. But the way they get away with it is they're taking advantage of the poverty okay. and the court system. The court system is, uh, is putting onerous burden. The burden of proof is on the indigenous peoples who are asserting the rights and saying, you have to make the claim. You have to meet the test. And that costs money. And so, really, it's an injustice system. Let's stay here for a minute on the discrepancy between um, recognition for Aboriginal rights and title and the policies that are aimed at stripping away um, Aboriginal rights and title through extinguishment policies and through um, the uh, in, in indebtedness process that communities get into through the land claims process that pushes them to extinguish rights when they, um, when they don't want to. Um, Art, I wonder if we could follow up with you on this discrepancy um, and ask you about, um, to kind of pick up from here, because what Russ seems to be describing is really this black box of um, Canadian policy on Aboriginal people where Indigenous rights go in, but they never come out. And so if we need to think outside the box of asserting Indigenous rights, where will the leverage come from for Indigenous people to assert their rights? I, I think one of the things uh, you, you need to understand is it, it, to appreciate what I'm talking about is, is, is Canada's uh, constitutional framework. And when I say Canada, I don't mean it in the sense that, uh, well, it's all Canada and we, we don't like it or something like that. What I'm trying to do is, is, is set in place a, a framework of, I guess, uh, Canada in terms of uh, two, two uh, kind of uh, realities. One is the, the very colonial part of, of Canada, the one that, that we do have an opportunity to change. And, and, and to understand that, we need to go back to the British North America Act of 1867, which was Canada's uh, first constitution of this country. And under that, uh, Great Britain uh, imposed on our Aboriginal and treaty territories uh, the, uh, that the lawmaking power will only happen in Ottawa or in the provincial capitals. Only two forms of government could make law in relationship to our Aboriginal title territories, our Aboriginal treaty territories, either the federal government or the provincial government. And that's what Russ refers to as section 91 and section 92 of the Canadian Constitution. 
and we operated that way from 1867 until 1982. And that constitution, the British North America Act Constitution, is a violation of our human rights as indigenous people to our right to self-determination. You know, that's where the Ontario government says that according to the Mining Act, we have the exclusive authority to be able to determine where mines can get permits or not get permits. It's, it's, it's a provincial jurisdiction, they call it, or a federal jurisdiction, you know. But it doesn't recognize that Indigenous people have any right to say anything in that, okay? And in 1980, I know uh, when Trudeau was talking about patriating the Constitution, changing the British North America Act into the Canadian Constitution here in Canada, my father, uh, late father uh, George Manuel, was the president of the uh, National I mean, of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and he got very nervous about that. And he organized the uh, the people, and they hired a train uh, that went from uh, Vancouver all the way to uh, Ottawa, and it became known as the Constitution Express. And uh, it was full, full of people. And uh, even had, they had, even had uh, some cars or vans that went along with it, it was so full. But I'm saying that especially to people from I don't know more, because this was a people's demonstration. People participated in, in that. It was probably the most successful uh, indigenous demonstration in this country of, of, of national proportion, it's, uh, to understand that. Because by the time they got to Ottawa, Prime Minister Trudeau wanted to meet with them, the Governor General wanted to meet with them. It just sort of focused all the attention of Indigenous people uh, clean across the country on that. I know that people along Ontario and other places uh, would provide food uh, to the people inside the train when they were coming across the country, you know, because that was how much in, in, uh, feeling people had. It was something that, 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 that woke people up to this whole issue. And then in 1981, they went to uh, London, uh, England, and they lobbied uh, the House of Lords and the House of Commons about it. They said that they needed to have their rights recognized and affirmed. By that time, indigenous people across Canada were involved in this issue. They, they all set up embassies in, in London, England, and they all lobbied. And they were so successful that that's how Section 35.1 got in the Constitution. Section 35.1 is that provision in the Canadian Constitution that says that the federal provincial government will recognize existing, you know, Aboriginal and treaty rights. You know, which for some of you might say, well, that doesn't really mean a heck of a lot. What does it really mean? You know what it means? It means that you have certain constitutional rights to do things uh, under your title and rights, like go hunt without having to ask the province for a hunting license. To go fish without having to ask the federal government to fish, like we fish for salmon, so it's a, it's a federal thing, not a provincial, or, or for those that fish, you know, uh, freshwater fish, also ask the province. And an, an Aboriginal title and treaty rights are, are, are also those uh, Section 35 based rights. So you need to understand that Section 35 provides you with a, uh, the, the capacity within the Canadian constitutional framework now to be able to create uh, your own economy, to create your own government, you know, without having to be beholden and under Section 91 or under Section 92. When Russ is talking about uh, municipal kind of government, he's talking about a municipality like under the federal or under the provincial kind of government, under section 91 or 92. No, we have a right to organize our own section 35 government relation in relationship to all our territory, including the territory underneath this building. If it's part of your Aboriginal title, uh, uh, title territory. Because you need to understand that in Canada, the bottom layer of property, the bottom layer of property throughout this whole Canada is Aboriginal or treaty territory. That's what it is. If there is any crown land, it sits on top of our land, and it's from crown land that they create 
the title that this building is built off, like if it's fee simple, or if it's a, or if it's a leasehold estate for some other area or some mining permit or some timber permit, it emanates out of some other property property right. But the underlying property is is your aboriginal free right. So you, you can use that as leverage, like what we did in the case of the Canada softwood lumber dispute, where Canada uh, and the United States were fighting over whether or not Canada was providing a, a, a fair market stumpage for uh, softwood lumber here in Canada. And, and uh, the United States imposed like this 27% countervailing duty on all two by fours that went in the United States. And Canada at that time was exporting $10 billion worth of two by four in the United States. And so Canada brought this to the World Trade Organization, asking the World Trade Organization to review it and reduce or eliminate that countervailing duty, that 27%. And we decided to intervene as the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade. And we argued that, sure, Canada's softwood lumber is subsidized by Canada's policy to not recognize, you know, Aboriginal tree rights, you know. And they were accepted by the World Trade Organization and they were accepted by NAFTA when they brought it to NAFTA. Even though in the NAFTA, the tribunal, there were three Canadians on the by panel. You know, so the thing is that we've been recognized at the international level that we have this underlying proprietary right. Because what they're saying about these two by fours, and that applies to this very same day, today, that despite the fact that it's logged under a provincial permit by some white company exported to New York and sold down at Home Depot to some through some white company, you still have a property in that two by four, you know? And in the cases of that, uh, of that software lumber dispute, the United States collected over $3 billion from that 27% countervailing duty. And the United States was prepared to give that to the native people in Canada because they didn't want to give it back to the industry, but our leadership wouldn't go after it, you know? So the thing is that, <laughs> You know, this is what I mean, that there's an underlying proprietary interest, and you can use institutions like WTO, even though people hate it, but you can use those kind of arguments against themselves. So I guess that's what you're talking about, where you use economic leverage in order to strengthen your position as Indigenous people. Thank you, Ron. Um, Russ, I wonder if you want to respond to that. I know. Um, you know, this raises a lot of strategic questions about how you actually go about leveraging that economic power, that proprietary interest that, as you described, Art, is, um, you know, inherent in all the resources and lands that are sold since they're indigenous lands. Um, that indigenous interest is inherent in the economy of, the political economy of Canada itself. So, Russ, what would you say about going about leveraging that kind of um, economic interest? I'd say it's gonna be up to the people because obviously, as Art said, the leaders don't have the nerve to do it. You know? You know, um, since the white paper, um, after the white paper in 1969, I don't know how many of you know of it, I know, you know, it's, um, it was basically the beginning of, um, termination policy in Canada, you know, where Gretchen wanted to get rid of, uh, you know, the legal and political status of Indians. But since that time, uh, you know, the Indian organizations were created, the National Indian Brotherhood, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, the Union of Ontario Indians, Union of Nova Scotia Indians, Union of New Brunswick Indians, uh, Quebec Indian Association. Uh, yeah, Union of BC Indian Chiefs. I, I mentioned them. Oh, then, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, you know, a lot of them did use the labor movement. That's why there, a lot of the early organizations were called unions. Um, they use that as a, a structure, uh, a model to uh, structure by. But, you know, what happened was uh, from that time, they started funding the uh, political organizations. 
and initially they did good work. I mean, they, they came up with the red paper and the brown paper and, you know, all rejecting the white paper. And, but what the government did from there, you know, starting in the, the 70s on, they started um, transferring the administration of programs and services to chiefs and councils, kind of making them the middlemen in terms of Ottawa designed programs with the terms and conditions of the funding and the band offices and the provincial territory organizations and the tribal councils all became part of that delivery system. And as they did, they started to become part of the federal transfer payment system and became dependent on that because there weren't other sources of revenue because on reserves, you know, we're denied access to our traditional territories and treaty territories, you know, Aboriginal title territories and uh, treaty territories. Um, because they argue the provinces are in control of those, like Art was saying, Section 91 and 92, federal and provincial powers. They don't recognize uh, indigenous uh, jurisdiction over those lands off reserve. And um, that's where they bring in the land claims policies and the self-government policy, and, you know, all the other policies. And then they bring in the, the court cases, you know, since 1982, limiting and restricting the interpretation of Section 35. So there's a noose around us, you know, that's coming in from the judicial side and the political side. And it's been happening, you know, for the last 30 years, especially. And the leadership is accountable to Ottawa. They're not accountable to the people under the, the funding arrangements. And they're scared, I think, to raise these, these uh, arguments about the doctrine of discovery. You know, the fact that, you know, Canada's based on theft, continued theft of lands and resources and that it should be Canada, you know, making the, their territorial claims uh, known instead of us. But, you know, there seems to be some kind of reverse psychology that all of a sudden we have to claim our lands and go to tables to do it. And, you know, really the people have to wake up and see that their leadership, you know, what they're negotiating, because often they're negotiating without consulting the people. And sometimes they're trying to convince their people, well, we're not extinguishing or no, we're not terminating. But if you look at the policies and the tables that they're at, that's exactly what they're doing. And the funding arrangements are tied to it, especially the ones that are taking loan funding. So the arguments that Art is making, you know, I haven't seen any of our leaders bring that up. You know, not the Assembly of First Nations, not the regional organizations. Uh, you know, some of them did support INET in the beginning. Um, but there hasn't been any sustained effort to uh, take on, you know, the uh, federal, and provincial, and territorial governments about their assertions of ownership over lands and resources. And I think it's because, you know, my own view is it's because, you know, we have this neo-colonial situation where our leadership is so tied up where they're basically paid at the band offices and the other organizations to manage the discontent of the people. To stop any kind of social movement from happening, because Ottawa doesn't like that. And Ottawa doesn't like it because we start bringing up these uncomfortable issues about who owns the land. You know, uh, an example is this um, negotiations around uh, uh, this Algonquins of Ontario uh, agreement principle they have. They're negotiating with one uh, band in Ontario and nine satellite groups. But really for them it's about getting clear title to the Parliament Hill, you know, the Prime Minister's residence, the Governor General's residence, because they're all sitting on unsurrendered Algonquin territory but they're ignoring the nine other Algonquin communities that form the Algonquin nation. You know, they created this fiction called the Algonquins of Ontario, but that never existed until they started these negotiations. The Ottawa River wasn't a boundary. All of a sudden they made it a boundary and said, okay, we'll negotiate with this group and ignore this group. But it's all about, you know, um, taking the lands and resources. You know, that's really what it's about. These are major issues. They don't, for us to get, our recognition of our Aboriginal treaty rights, it means a redistribution of uh, power and wealth in this country. And that's not gonna happen without a struggle. I mean, I don't care, you look around the world, any, any, kind, of, uh, any kind of struggle for um, self-determination and land, you know, it's, it's a struggle. They're not just gonna hand it over. Or, sh you know, even sharing it is, is a, a fight to get them to share it. Um, their policies are one-sided and, um, you know, they've got our leadership, uh, it seems, in a position where, you know, with all the stuff that Harper's doing, how, how much do you see the leadership saying anything in the press right now? Even the budget. To me, the budget announcement that just came down was like Harper giving the middle finger to Indigenous peoples. And we, uh, we hear a muted response or no response from our leadership. 
I mean, that should tell you something right there, how afraid they are that they're going to get their own funding cut if they say anything. So they're going along, you know, with, um, with these uh, termination policies and not challenging them. Because that's what I think uh, the leaders have to do is not try and fight us as the people. That's what they're doing. They need to turn around and fight the government and say those policies have to go. But they won't do it without the people pushing them. That's, that's what I want. So what Art's talking about, I don't think it'll happen without people power. Art, could you um, speak to um, people coming into the movement now, uh, drawing from your experience uh, being part of and witnessing and hearing stories from your dad about um, what Indigenous struggle has looked like and what it's taken to gain some measure of victory along, yep. along the years? Uh, what, would you, what advice would you give the movement today? Well, I think one of the things I'd just like to do is agree with what uh, Russell uh, is saying about the, you know the people needing to, to, to get involved. Like I like I've been around for quite a few years, and uh, my father used to uh, organize uh, before any kind of core funding uh, money for Indian organizations were were available. We organized back in the the 1950s and through the 1960s and really was until the 70s that they, they started uh, getting getting money uh, from the government um, and um, I think one of the things when they started getting money uh, it was useful like what Russ was saying to begin with when uh, it allowed the organizations in those days to uh, get uh, the red paper and uh, brown paper and all these different position papers written that allowed them to staff up. And for I think for the first five years it was probably effective. But people should examine that. Because one of the things, uh, the, the climate has changed a lot since then. Even though people say that uh, nothing's really changed, things have kind of changed uh, a bit. Like what I said about the Constitution, you know, we basically beat the Trudeau and Chrétien on the Constitution because they really wanted to terminate us and we actually got them to have to recognize existing and, and uh, Aboriginal treaty rights. Um, and uh, legally, legally we beat them in, in the Supreme Court in terms of Delta Mulk, in terms of Nicosun Treaty Rights, all these different things. Like generally, we've, we've come out ahead, not 100%, there's always a 60-40 kind of split, but we've always come up on top in most cases. And uh, we beat them internationally. You know, Canada was the only country that voted against the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples twice, once on the UN Human Rights Council and once before the General Assembly. So the thing is that we beat them 100 and, I don't know, 143 to 4, you know. <laughs> then they have to even reverse their decision domestically, so we beat them there again. And we beat them like in the WTO and NAFTA on subsidies, you know. And the thing is what I'm saying is that we beat them so many times, well, why hasn't it really changed? This is the big question. There has to be, like what Russ says, a, a, a basic fundamental change in the government, in the executive branch, by cabinet in this country. And that fundamental change is between extinguishing, extinguishing our rights to recognizing and affirming our rights. You know, those, that's the fundamental difference. And it's a political decision that rests in the mind of the prime minister and the cabinet. It doesn't rest in the minds of the courts or the international trade tribunals or in the constitution or anything, no, it's a political decision. And the Department of Indian Affairs and its extinguishing policy has been guiding Indian policy 
since for the last since Canada began, and they're still guiding it, and that's where all the problems stem from. Their job is to extinguish and assimilate Indigenous people, and that's it. And we've been fighting for recognition, you know, and affirmation of our rights and titles. So we're at two collision points there. And that's where I don't know more, I think, was really effective. And, uh, and when Teresa Spence's hunger strike was very effective in putting the heat on the Prime Minister. And that's where the heat has to continue to be put on the Prime Minister. And also on our establishment organizations, not the Salah South in the end. So well, that's the other thing that needs to be put in there. But I think it's important to, to, to understand that that's the direction. All the action has to go across this country. Because the main issue is that you need to deal with the land first before you deal with self-government. Because it's the land that you have government over, you know. <laughs> so the thing is, if you don't settle that first, you won't be able to get on. And that's my dad's advice. That's my dad, Jordan. That's what he'd always tell me: deal with the land first. You know, don't deal with self government because they'll, they'll they'll try to suck you in. You know, so that you'll have government, but you won't have government over anything else. But <laughs> so the thing is that. Uh, you know, that's the issue is that support the people against the mines, support the people against the, against this kind of industries. Because when you're doing that, what you're saying is that that's a section 35 one decision. It's, you need to recognize and affirm our Aboriginal treaty rights, which is our right to protect Mother Earth for the animals. And for the This is called Nation to Nation, the conversation. So I want to welcome if people have questions or comments to come up to the mic, or if you have disability issues and need the mic taken to you, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic over to you. Uh, Rebecca Tababana. Great, thank you so much. Um, I totally appreciate all of your words. They're very thoughtful and grounded. And um, I've been involved in I Know No More um, since the beginning. And really was pulled by the power of the people and um, going to Ottawa. And one of the most moving days was on the Day of Action um, back in January, at the very end of Teresa Spence's hunger strike, where thousands of communities members um, marched and Teresa um, and various chiefs in Ontario and Manitoba were demanding a uh, meeting with um, Harper and um, Governor General. And it seemed like we had that momentum. Um, we had the media, Canada, the world, and um, to demand that nation to nation meeting. And I cannot tell you how disappointed I was when the national chief and um, other chiefs um, kind of missed that opportunity, it seems, to hold the government accountable and demand that meeting at that level and to have, um, you know, Canada um, take uh, responsibility to look at itself with the media attention. And so I just um, am wondering about leadership. Like, I know that grassroots, we are leaders, um, but when we talk about nation to nation now, who are our leaders? And I would like to hear from both of you what your perception of that is. I'll defer to the other first. <laughs> Did you want to answer that? Right Age now? before beauty. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think one of the things is. <laughs> I think one of the things that um, I do agree with you that. Uh, that the AFN and, and our national chief should not have met with, with the Prime Minister when they did. And I think uh, that, that really puts the onus back on, on us as Indigenous people, and that's a kind of, kind of support I don't know more. And, uh, and you have to define 
really, I think nowadays, uh, your leadership, you know, and uh, in, in, in how you're going to decide where you're going because, like I said before, the establishment organizations, and I know this because I, my daughter was in one that helped build the uh, organization of chiefs, you know, like I was telling somebody here before, when uh, he was a leader in the 1950s, the 19, uh, the Indian agent used to talk to our chief, tell him what he wanted in the BCR, get him to sign the BCR, then he'd go back to the Indian agency in Canada and type it up in the BCR for the day for the band. And that was, and him to get the Indian agent to stop that was a big fight. Because we had, as Indian people, we had really no recognized leaders from outside the community, you know. And now we've gotten to a point where these leaders have been taking money from the government, a lot of money, and uh, because of that they're inhibited in terms of their capacity to fight that government, you know. Yet we're sometimes asking our leaders too, well, we want jobs, or we want this or that. I don't know if we, we actually say that. I never really heard anybody say that, but that's what the media is always saying, we're saying, is that we're always telling our leaders we want jobs, and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, we're putting an onus on them to produce some uh, 91, 92 kind of jobs and, uh, and benefits for us. And uh, they're playing along and making deals with government and with industry. And that sort of undermines our sovereignty position, you know. So we as a people have to send a clear message to, our, to people who are going to assume, I guess, leadership roles, like what we expect from them as leaders. And uh, we can't have it both ways, you know. We want to go and talk about getting our land rights back then we better, in BC for instance, we better quit borrowing money and we better pull away from the negotiation table, we better fire those lawyers and consultants that have been spending that $500 million, you know, and get them out of our, get them out of our uh, pocketbook, get them out of our wallet. And then we can get down to, to forming a real, um, uh, I guess, set of principles and guidelines that our leadership sh should be following, you know? Because right now, um, when I heard they were going to go to meet with the Prime Minister, I said, you know what the first meeting they're gonna have after they meet with the Prime Minister? They're gonna have a budget meeting with the Prime Minister's office. So the Prime Minister will say, well, I'll give you 500 million. And they'll say, no, we want 1.5 million. And they'll settle at a million. You know, but then they will just hire themselves to meet with the government. That's the kind of people we have in our organizations. That's the kind of leadership we have now in front of leading us now. And we have to send a clear message no, those are not the kind of people we want. We want a new leadership, a strong leadership, independent. And we accept that. But it's up to us. What, what I've suggested, I think, in writing is um, that I think that there needs to be forums created, people's forums, um, and the leadership need to be brought in. But, you know, I know there's concern of the leaders that they don't want to get into a mob mentality kind of thing where they walk into a room with hundreds of people and just be attacked, you know. Uh, it has to be, uh, you know, managed and... Because even in, uh, you know, Haudenosaunee territory, when you go into the longhouse, there's protocol. You just don't get up and start yelling at each other across the room, at least for the most part. <laughs> and um, there's a way to conduct yourselves at meetings. And I think that, you know, you can be respectful and, and still get to the truth of things. But I think there has to be more openness and accountability in the leaders and what the hell are they negotiating. Uh, like right now, there's a contribution agreement that are to be signed for the new fiscal year. My understanding is Bill C-27 is uh, one of the conditions uh, that they have to accept. Uh, and that's the First Nations Fiscal Transparency Act. Well, a lot of community people think that's a good thing because they think, you know, there's not enough disclosure. My concern is it's, again, Ottawa dictating from the top down what the rules of that should be when we should be deciding that. I mean, even the Penner Report, you know, the uh, Special Parliamentary Committee on Indian Self-Government, 1983, recommended that 
you can't have two masters. You can't be accountable to Ottawa and accountable to your people. That's what they said to the feds. And they said that there should be, First Nations should be recognized as a distinct order of government in Canada, separate from the provinces and separate from the, the feds. You know, what Art was talking about, Section 91 and 92 powers. And then we have to keep in mind that, uh, and I'm just talking about First Nations or Indians here, um, you know, we have to keep in mind that uh, each community has its own story about how the Indian Act has impacted and displaced traditional governments. I mean, I'm from Ganawagi, you know, originally, that's my home community. We got three longhouses. We should only have one. But we got three groups of traditional people all trying to say who's got the best interpretation of traditional law. And then we got the Indian Act elective system on top of that that's really the ones running the show because they have the money and are dealing with the programs and services. So we have lots of debates, uh, you know, around who should be the leaders. But I, I think, um, you know, there's the community level discussions, but there's also the nation level and regional discussions. And forums like this, you know, it'd be good to get some leaders out and have them answer some questions like, uh, like the regional vice chief of Ontario or, you know, uh, the chief of the Union of Ontario. Not to pick on them or anything, but we're in Ontario, you know, so I'm just using them as examples. You know, it could be BC, you know, the First Nations Summit, uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, President. You know, people like that should have forums where the people get to come out and ask questions like, what the hell's going on here, you know? What the hell happened on July, January 11th at the Prime Minister? You know, how did you come up with these eight points? How come getting rid of that self-government policy wasn't one of them? Because it's not on there. You know, and the Prime Minister told them no to all, most of their points anyway, except to have a high-level process. And you know what the government came back with in their high-level process? They had subsequent meetings after that, and they said, okay, we're going to give you two senior officials committees, one on treaty implementation and one on comprehensive claims reform. The federal officials will be the same on both socks, they call them. So two, two socks. And... Um, the federal co-chair is uh, Jean-Francois Tremblay, they said, who's the assistant deputy minister of treaties and Aboriginal governance and Aboriginal affairs. So this high level process about cabinet and the prime minister that Art's talking about, that's what was asked for. They took it right back down into the Aboriginal affairs department who has to, to a guy who's a middle management guy who has to report to the deputy minister and does what the deputy minister says and says he'll be the co-chair of these high level processes. Now, I hear AFN didn't accept that, but that's what Harper came back with. So, the leadership, I think, is impotent without the people. The people are the power. And for leadership, somehow we have to come to um, transform the Indian Act systems and, that, and these regional organizations that we have and start getting them to involve more, uh, more of our natural leadership, you know, to come out. But a lot of it is setting up the forums for that to happen. Because the institutions that are there, the Indian Act and the organizations being created, it won't happen uh, within those structures. Uh, I'll just give one last example and then shut up. Uh, recently on APTN, there was a hunger striker, um, um, Shelley Young. She tried to go meet with the chiefs at the Atlantic Policy Congress. This was on APTN on the news, I don't know if you saw it. And they said, no, you can't, you're not on the agenda. <laughs> And they said it's a secret meeting. So, you know, just a few days before that, the, you know, she stopped her hunger strike because uh, she was protesting the chiefs and their negotiations at these, what I call the termination tables. They claim it's not, the chiefs. But anyway, that relationship evaporated when she showed up at the, uh, the meeting of all the chiefs in the Atlantic, and they said, no, you can't come in. So there's an example of, uh, it's not gonna work under the existing systems. They, the people have to demand changes to them and create forums uh, to have accountability. Uh, we don't have time for everyone's questions, but we'll try to take a few more from the back mic now question. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, thanks for the organizers for this forum and this excellent panel. Uh, my name's Barry. I speak for Corpus Action. We come as allies to this uh, discussion. Uh, and I want to ask about the divided rule tactics, so let me set a context. Uh, I think Russ made a powerful statement you know, which, which leads to the conclusion that the courts are part of the colonial settler state and they're thus are not neutral on matters of property ownership, nor should they expect to be expected to be neutral. Uh, extinguishment of native title, the termination policy as we described it, is not just a government policy, 
It's a policy of, of the system, or the ruling class, if you will. It's much deeper. Extinguishment of, of uh, it, it's about privatization of land resources and the structures that have been built on them. Um, it's the neoliberal agenda as applied to indigenous people. What I'm getting at is the points of common interest that indigenous and non-indigenous people share at this time in, in, in dealing with the attacks on our rights. Now, it was Tom Flanagan who was the chief proponent of this extinguishment until he sort of uh, exposed himself. <laughs> but privatization is a far-reaching policy of capitalist governance. It is aimed at garbage collection, public transit, health services, highways, uh, the three P's policy, extension of property rights, intellectual property rights, which we see being negotiated in the European and Trans-Pacific Agreement. Would you mind if I asked you to ask your question? Because yep. we have so many avoiding. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, how far advanced is class differentiation across the indigenous communities now since the aim of the policy is to try to get native communities to buy into the idea of privatizing everything, just as governments are trying to privatize everything else affecting the entire population in this state. Art, question on the proletariat? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think one of the things is that it does, uh, just the uh, fee simple idea of privatization of land and that doesn't have a very broad based support. I think there's a lot of uh, communities that are totally dead set against it, but it is definitely uh, something that indigenous people are aware of and uh, will always take into consideration uh, both the uh, our sharing and uh, as being a model for our, our, our development of self-government. There is definitely a management class and I've written about it and it exists amongst the people at the band offices, the provincial territory organizations, the tribal councils, um, you know, and I, I work within the system. I include myself in that uh, you know, as part of being part of the management class. Um, it exists, it's made up of the chief and councils, it's made up of the staff of those organizations to the band level right up to AFN. And, it, and the lawyers, um, you know, and advisors. Um, and basically they're part of the management class that uh, are dependent on the federal transfer system and they've been created by federal transfers uh, to achieve the objectives of the Canadian state. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the spirit of honoring the role of women in the Idle No More movement, I'm gonna exercise gender parity and take a man and then a woman. So Tannis yeah. is next. But I think in terms of recognizing uh, our, our recognize our removing colonial doctrine of discovery, there's there's some real serious discussions that, that have to happen in terms of recognizing Aboriginal treaty rights, for instance. Um, one of them is issues of compensation and remuneration for Indigenous people, simply because. As soon as the government recognizes that we do have these rights that like you're saying, then the uh, remuneration that we have as, uh, we're supposed to receive remuneration for all that's been taken from our land since the beginning of, of settlement, because you actually have owned property in that. And that's, a pos that's something that the government does not want to deal with. In fact, in their negotiations under this comprehensive land claims policy, you'll see that compensation is a non-starter as far as they're concerned. But as soon as you talk about recognition, it becomes an issue 
because that's part of recognition. Okay, you know, it's sort of like they, when they recognize you own this building, and you're going to say, well, when am I going to get some benefit from it? <laughs> and you're going to be able to hire any kind of lawyer who's going to be able to actually go after some kind of form of remuneration. So the thing is that you need to have to come up with some form of agreement before they'll even agree to remove some of these, you know, uh, when they start uh, this, when they remove the colonial documents and discovery and start recognizing certain they they'll, they'll want to have agreements before those things are even done. But there are discussions that we don't even have as Indigenous people. Because one of the things that if they can't pay you, one of the things the government says, the reason it's not on the table is that we can't pay you, therefore why even talk about it? But the thing is that we don't want it off the table either because we've suffered enormously decade after generation after generation from being denied access and benefits to, to our property. And therefore, if you can't pay it though, maybe we could hold it in abeyance if you recognize that we have certain rights in relationship to protecting Mother Earth in our territory. And so you take environmental jurisdiction away from them. And we'll say, as long as you do that, then we won't collect the debt, you know? But there are certain things that we will say, maybe from a certain point, you do need to pay remuneration. Like in British Columbia, it would be after Delgamo or something since 1997 and uh, that you, you, you've actually owed us money for, for that. Or you might say since a certain date in your treaty or certain something other than that. But I'm just saying there's a lot of discussion that has to happen around this whole notion of, re, you know, rec, of removing the colonial doctrines of discovery, of recognizing our aboriginal tree rights, discussions that have to be community-based and then figure it out. Uh, question at the back, Mike. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I was hoping that more people would be aware of this, but the doctor that discovered Terry Nullius, under decolonization of the Western Sahara, through decolonization becomes null and void. Through the international courts, 16 judges were asked by the United Nations what their thoughts would be on Terry Nullius being, uh, having existing rights or not. They came back 13 to, six, to, six, 13 to, to 3, stating that Terra Nullius, the doctrine of discovery, is null and void when peoples have been uh, nomadic, especially throughout the Western Sahara. So I know that uh, Jody Ray Gould is looking at trying to get bring that to the Supreme Court in, the, in BC. Have either of you heard anything about that since? No, I, I haven't heard specifically anything that Jolie's doing uh, about that, but uh, I know definitely in the in the case of the, the Chalcotin that it was raised, what arguments they're going to make, I, I'm not privy to, because that, that, that's a specific legal argument that the, the Chalcotin lawyers would be involved in, or interveners. Okay, I hope we shall get an answer soon, but that would be very interesting for us to look into more, because that is a solution. Thank you very much for your question. We have a question from our online audience. They were supposed to be two constitution, constitutional table talks. Do you think a second table will happen on jurisdiction? Well, um, what happened in 1983, um, there was a section 37 uh, which set up that there had to be a First Minister's Conference on Aboriginal Matters within one year of the Constitution coming into force. That was the 1983 First Minister's Conference. And um, the purpose of that conference was to identify and define the meaning of Section 35, what does Aboriginal treaty rights mean. But what happened was um, Rennie Levesque showed up and he put uh, Mary Tuax early on, uh, on his seat and she raised the, uh, you know, the sexual inequality issue within the Indian Act and uh, you know, uh, I think Billy Two Rivers got up from Gunawagi and um, raised other issues because they were part of the coalition of First Nations that didn't agree with the patriation. Um, so based on these side issues, other people started talking about how 
um, you know, men and women should be treated the same under the law on that. So what they did was they came up with a 1983 Constitutional Amendment Act where they amended Section 35 to include Section 35.3, which I think says that the laws will be guaranteed equally between men and women. And also the James Bay Cree uh, lobbied hard to get Section 35.4 added, which says, for greater certainty, any land claims agreement that has been settled or may be settled is a treaty within the meaning of 35.1. And 35.1 is the one that says we recognize and affirm Aboriginal treaty rights. So then they set out a schedule of further meetings, because you know the Constitution only provided for one meeting, 1983. And so with that amendment, they said there would be one in 84, one in 85, and one in 87. And there were, then there was a whole bunch of issues put on there and on, on the agenda. Aboriginal title was on there. They had like, I don't know, 15, 20 issues. If you look at the Constitution Act 19, the amendment 1983, you'll see the agenda attached. Point is that they amended the Constitution to have these further First Minister's talks. But instead of talking about defining Section 35, it just became, you know, a discussion of the agenda items. and. It, Self-government became the one that moved its way up to the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they didn't talk about jurisdiction in that. Like I said, they were moving on from Aboriginal issues in 1987 to the Quebec's uh, distinct society status. And then, you know, they moved on to uh, Senate and all that stuff kind of all came together in the Charlottetown Accord in 1992, which was the last effort at constitutional reform, uh, which was voted on in a national referendum and rejected. Mm. including on a lot of Indian reserves, they rejected it as well. Mm. Even though the, uh, the right to self-government was included in the package along with distinct society and all that. So I doubt that uh, there's any appetite uh, with a Quebec separatist government in place uh, to have um, any kind of constitutional talks reopened at this time. Yeah, someone get this guy a book deal. Um, Mama D? Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the issue because I, I'm pretty from London, Saskatchewan. One of my teachers uh, in this discussion was about leadership. Um, leadership involves wisdom and the big wisdom is the ability to listen to people. And the second part of it, and expertise and a knowledge, but the big part of it was the ability to share that knowledge. That that was the prerequisite. You just don't get this knowledge imported. So you could have leaders for certain things because they had expertise in certain things. But whether they were considered a leader or a name the leader was their ability to share that knowledge. That was the empowerment. That's, that was the stabilizing, balancing influence amongst leaderships. And we don't, we don't have that. The other thing is, I just wanted to mention, I was with an organization and we did work by consensus and we did need money to get going. And we had these positions that the government wanted. So we worked by consensus. At the end of our meetings, we put our names in the hat. And this person would be the president for the purpose of signing the document. So we compartmentalized. Um, I'd like to see, I mean, maybe this isn't a question, the answer. I'd like to see discussions about these alternative forms of resistance in terms of compartmentalizing. My great great grandmother was a big compartmentalist. So she had the big table and she had. The Christian stuff on the table, and she'd look over at the Saskatchewan River and it was coming, oh, and then she'd move that under the table and I put it. And she maintained both. And I just thought that there's all, you know, our imaginations, we can't be crippled with our, by like, colonized imaginations. Thanks, Mommy. Uh, I'm really sorry. I know that there's still people in line to speak, but we need to take a short break before we move on to the next panel. So, unfortunately, we don't really have time for any more questions, but I want to um, invite you to join me in thanking Russell Dybo and Art Manuel for a really stimulating time. We're going to take a break for um, just three or four minutes to change panelists, so please stay with us. <laughs>